Hey gang, welcome back for another video here on Joe Cabin. All right, so in a previous video, we were introduced to the Wittig reaction, right? We know it's a way for us to have a carbonyl and something we call a yilid. And if we smush those two together, we can produce alkenes. And in the previous video, we talked about um, alkenes that resulted in Z double bonds, or in a lot of cases, that they were also cis. So, uh, there's actually a small caveat with Wittig reactions, so this is kind of part two. So I want to do a little quick review of a reaction we've seen before, and then I want to kind of throw you uh, all the new concept with Wittigs. But it's just something tiny bit extra, nothing groundbreaking, nothing earth shattering. So, uh, but I just want some teachers decide to teach this, some teachers don't. But I just want to make sure to arm you all with every piece of knowledge possible. Okay, so. If we look at this fitting reaction right here, it's obvious that this is our carbonyl. It happens to be an aldehyde. And then here's our yilid, right? Y-L-I-D-E. And sometimes yilids are drawn like this, but just know that a lot of other people, you know, there's some resonance here. Yilids can also be drawn or expressed where a lone pair is straight up given to a carbon. You have the carbanion, and then you have a positive charge on a phosphorus. So this, these are just resonance structures of each other. Just don't ever get thrown off if you see your yield look like this and you don't see the, the, you know, the negative and positive explicitly drawn. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and erase this. So, we know a Wittig reaction is kind of like a one-step mechanism. I'm gonna draw it real quick. This is a bit of a warm-up before I throw in the new bit of uh, you know, Wittig information. So. You know, well, of course, I erased the resonance structure, but we have the lone pair on the carbon, and we have a positive charge here. So this carbon being negative, right? We saw that in the resonance structure, right? He's negative. The carbon is negative, rather. The carbon is interested in a positive carbonyl carbon, and this oxygen, right, which is, so we have, you know, partial positive, partial negative, and partial positive here, right? We have a, two, you know, a pair of partial po positive and partial negatives that are interested in one another. Right, so this carbon is going to take the electrons in this double bond, and that carbon is going to go ahead and bond to the carbonyl carbon. The uh, oxygen is going to take, you know, the pair of electrons from the double bond, and that oxygen is very interested in the phosphorus. Right, so we kind of have, you know, one from each budding up with the other. So if I go ahead and draw my intermediate. Remember, we're gonna make that kind of square, you know, type intermediate. So what I like to do is I like to draw, so this is my phosphorus down here. I'm gonna draw my yilid, right? So I know the asterisk carbon bonded to the, I'm gonna dot this carbon. So if I draw a dot right here, and I know the dot carbon was always bonded to the oxygen, and I know the oxygen bonded to the phosphorus, right? Cool. I just need to kind of fill in what was off of the dot carbon, which is just one, two, three more carbons. One, two, three. So I know, sorry, I didn't really draw this spatially great, but this is my intermediate. And at this point, right, we know that phosphorus and oxygen bond really well with one another. So we have kind of this inverse square type thing where this bond is gonna break and a double bond is gonna form between phosphorus and oxygen. And then this bond is gonna break and go towards a double bond right here. And remember, with Yelid, or uh, with the Wittig reaction, well, from what we know right now, we always form uh, a Z double bond, right, or cis. It's always going to be Z, but cis more often, um, right? Because if we look at the double bond with the way the steric work in the intermediate, we, you know, form the cis double bond because that's kind of the confirmation that the structure takes to stabilize. No, I'm going to. Hold on, I'm gonna draw this a little bit differently because I'm running out of space up here. I'm actually gonna just draw it over here. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, right? But the point being the double bond right here, we don't cross it if we traverse it, right? It looks like that. Okay, so that's our warm up. But what I want to introduce you all too, and it's crazy that it just changes this much, but if we have a Wittig reaction where all I change about the problem is actually gonna look super similar, is if 
I make my yillid very oh so slightly different. If I have a yillid that where the carbon that's in the yillid is directly attached to some type of conjugated system, like this, has to be just a conjugated system, then in what in fact you see is instead of making the Z double bond, you make a an E double bond, okay? So this was the warm up, this is what we knew to be true before. So you, nothing changes about your knowledge of the Wittig reaction, right? The mechanism still proceeds the same. However, if your yield is right off of a conjugated system, something's changed in the transition state. The transition state's actually a little bit more stable because of this conjugated system. So you can form this E double bond instead of the Z. And based on our previous knowledge of alkenes, right? This is uh, trans double bonds, right? You see them more in nature, trans E. Uh, not the same, but I'm in this situation they are. Um, they're more you know, prevalent in nature because they're more stable uh, than Z. So what I can do is, you, I don't think you would need to ever show this to someone, but what I'll do is I'll pause the video, I'll erase this, I will show you the transition state here and uh, kind of explain, or I'll show it to you and then explain that it looks this way and it, because, it looks this way because of the conjugated system, uh, which provides extra stability, which is why you get an E double bond and then we'll do one more example to drive it home. Okay, gang. So all I did was erase the top reaction, which was just a very normal Wittig reaction, nothing conjugated coming off of our gillid. And I just replaced with what is the transition state that explains our E double bond product below. Okay, so these nothing has changed about these arrows, right? We know that our gillid can also be expressed like this with a lone pair on the carbon and a positive charge on the phosphorus. And we know that we, that explains why this carbon is interested in the positive, partial with positive carbonyl carbon, which is also why the oxygen is, uh, you know, particularly interested in that partially positive phosphorus. So if we look up here and kind of digest what's going on, typically in a normal Wittig reaction, right, we form our kind of little square, which is two carbons, one that's attached to phosphorus, one that's attached to oxygen. We have the three phenyl groups coming off of our phosphorus. You know, we have an R group here, and we have an R group here, right? And we see this action, which is why we form typically, you know, our Z double bond that we're accustomed to seeing. However, remember, it's the conjugate, it's the conjugated system off of our yield that's the game changer. So our intermediate looks different. Different in the way that, you know, our four carbon or our four atom system can configure itself such that we position ourselves, right? We see a dash here and a wedge here. So that means we kind of have ring going down and methyl group thing going up, right? So opposite sides. That's why it's gonna be an E double bond as opposed to the same side, Z double bond in a normal Wittig reaction. So I don't ever know that you'd have to draw a transition state for someone. I think if anything, in my experience, teachers either choose to include this extra part with having the conjugated system and making E double bonds or they don't include it at all. So I think just knowing how to complete the reaction is enough, but you've also seen the transition state and the arrow would go like this to make a double bond there. This bond, which means this bond is open to doing this, which is how we get that product over there. Okay, let me just clean this up. We'll do one more, you know, just to complete the reaction and we'll call it a video. Okay, gang, so let's do two Wittig uh, problems and then we'll call it a video. All right, so in this first problem above, we can see that we've been given the carbonyl and we have a gillid over the arrow, right? So now we've labeled who is who. Okay, so what we need to do here is recognize two things. One, uh, what kind of yield do we have? Do we have a yield that we have like a conjugated system kind of stemming from the yield itself, right? So the yield is right here. 
And I think you can see the answer is yes. Right off the yellow, this carbon right here, we can see sp2, 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 right? And that fits the bill for a, a conjugated system, right? We have two or, you know, we've more than two atoms in a row that are sp2 hybridized. So this is in fact, um, you know, we will, if, you know, when we're thinking, are we making the E or the Z double bond? The answer is because of this conjugation right here in our yield, we are gonna be making the E double bond, okay? And I know I said, we need to think about two things, but that's actually just one. So, we know that we're going to have this carbon attacking that carbon, and then this oxygen attaching to the phosphorus, right? So, I'm gonna draw this up here. We have carbon, carbon, oxygen, phosphorus. I'm not gonna draw this accurately. Oh, that's just pH three, and there's three of them. Okay, and then one, two, three, four. One, two, three, well, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Right, we know that these two are gonna bond together, these two are gonna bond together. And I may not have drawn this accurately, but remember, I need to end with a an E double bond, right? So like, remember, it's like like trans, but not, and that's not the accurate uh, way to describe that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw this, and I know I'm gonna have a double bond between this carbon and this carbon, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and dot this, and then I'm gonna asterisk this, right? And so remember, E and Z kind of work like stereochemistry, right? The path you walk depends on how big the pieces are, like how what it, what is heaviest attached to that carbon, right? So between this methyl group and this ethyl group, right? This is the path that I'll end up kind of walking when I walk this double bond, right? This is the double bond right here. So remember, this is E. So E is so Z is on the same side. E is not. So I want to go this way. So off of the asterisk carbon, I have one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase this and I'll rehash that because that wasn't the best explanation. So remember, right, because we saw, okay, I have this carbonyl, I have yield. The yield has a conjugated section straight off of it. We know that alters the transition state so that we make E double bonds, not Z double bonds. So I know I have my dot carbon and my carbonyl he's going, that carbon will be freshly double bonded to the asterisk carbon to my yield. So when I make my product, right, I know that I need to make an E double bond, not Z. And this isn't, this is not a situation where we do not have cis trans here, right? Because we have too many groups attached to our double bond. So we you know this will expose us if we don't know what E and Z are. So, you know, I know my yield has one, two, three, four, five carbons in it. One, two, three, four, five. I'm double bonded to the four carbon piece, and I know when I walk this double bond, I'm going to go the way where it's, I only have one direction this way, but when I hit this crossroads here, I pick the side that is heavier, that is the ethyl side. So it's that, this is my product, an E double bond. Okay, so let's go down below. So this one meant to be a little tricky, hopefully it's not. So if I look here, I'm giving my carbonyl, Here's my yield. So, I hope you're thinking, okay, Joe, I see what you're trying to do. You did give me a carbonyl, and you put some type of aromatic, you know, like conjugated system right off of it, but that doesn't matter, right? You only make E double bonds when your yield is the, the thing that is next door to a conjugated system. It doesn't matter what the carbonyl is, right? So this, this is business as usual, right? This is gonna be a Z double bond. So it's that carbon that's a dot, this carbon that's an asterisk. I'll redraw this. Here's my dot carbon. I'm gonna go ahead and draw a double bond. That will be to my asterisk carbon. And then remember, this is a Z double bond. So if I'm walking this double bond, I better bond the same side. And that's my product right there. Okay, so this video, nice little review of the Vitig reaction. Again, 
But remember, it was also, you know, a, this video was, the point of it was to introduce what happens when you have a conjugated system right off your gillen, like we see above. Instead of making, you know, either a cis double bond or more generically a Z double bond, we get an E double bond because of how it alters the transition state. Okay, gang, thanks for tuning in uh, to this video. If you're a little shaky on it, go ahead and uh, throw it back. Check out the first Vidig reaction, you know, video where, you know, we get introduced to the reaction, we kind of get our footing, and then maybe come back to this one and hopefully things make a little bit more sense. Uh, but anyways, you know, even if you don't throw it back to those good times, I'll see you in the next video.